Amen. I'm going to start teaching on the doctrines concerning the timing of the rapture. Um, <clears throat> I think people base their opinions on rhetoric and so on and don't really know doctrines of why we believe certain things. And I want to break down some things um, and help us to understand what the Bible's saying when it comes to the timing, quote, of the rapture. Uh, we know as Baptists, we don't really look for a rapture. We're not told that. We're, we're told to look for the resurrection, which, has, which in itself, if you want to use the word rapture, is correct, in that people will be resurrected to life, and then people that are alive and remain will be in glorified bodies and meet the Lord. Amen. So we, we learn all that, and so now we know what I mean when I say rapture. I, I don't mean it the same way as the world means it. And I was started to have my board up here, and, and then I, I won't do that. I'll just try to remind you all where you can get the gist of where I'm going today. Today, before we start talking about rapture timing and all this, I think we have to get uh, to the basics of, of uh, the study of end times. What's the basics? What, what is the, the continuing truth about the Lord's return? Once we get that, now we can build. Because if we start trying to make speculation without building that foundation, we're going to end up having just that, speculation. I don't want to speculate. Another word for speculate is gamble. I don't want to gamble on this. I want to know what God is talking about. I want to be ready for whatever He says for me to be ready for. Amen? So anyway, Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. He says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, a lot of people are preached that the time is at hand there. They're talking about the second coming, but that's not what it says. It says the time of the revelation is at hand. There's a lot more to the revelation than just the return of Christ. Amen. There's a lot more to it. So anyway, let, let's keep going. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. You know, we sing the song, Unclouded Day. <laughs> I, I get what they're saying, you know, uh, spiritually they're saying it won't be any uh, muck and mutter and things like that. When Jesus comes back, all things will be clear. But I want to tell you, look what it says. Behold, he cometh with clouds. So the next time we see Jesus, what should we see with it? Clouds. Amen. Anyway, and every eye shall see him. That's interesting. It's not like, bloop, we disappeared, don't know why. It says, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I want to talk about eschatology today. Since this is our doctrinal time, I want to talk about the doctrine of last things, also known as uh, eschatology. And I want to give you an overview of, of what I believe the Bible says about eschatology. And I'll also introduce you to a couple things that the world says uh, about eschatology and religions. And let's see what God has for us this morning. So the study of eschatology is, first of all, very, very important. It's a doctrine just like every other doctrine. Amen. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if eschatology, the study of last things, this doctrine is part of the truth, we need to rightly divide it. Amen. 
So why would I study eschatology? Well, there's, there's three things that come across my mind right off. Um, number one, it does pertain to sound doctrine. Amen. We have to study it. If we're going to understand doctrine, we have to understand the doctrine of the last times. And it's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that says all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So if we cut out the parts that deal with eschatology, then we're not following what this is teaching us. That all scripture is profitable for doctrine. Amen. And I'm cutting these verses a little short today. I want to get all these concepts across to you. And if you want a copy of this uh, message, that's not a problem. I can email it to you. I can give you a copy. Uh, I will tell you at the onset, I had Marty Tate uh, when they were members here back in 2012. Well, I didn't have him do it. He did it. He got up and taught. I'm talking over 20 lessons on eschatology and did a tremendous job. And so now here it is eight years later. And I think it's time we revisit it to know what we're talking about and how it affects our life every day. And I'm not using his outlines. He does not outline like Brother Sam at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I read through his and I understand his preaching completely now because of the way he, he, he writes it out. I, on the other hand, I'll chase rabbits and stuff because I don't do that. I just give an outline and I just speak my heart. Amen. So we're two totally different preachers. But I will tell you, it made my workload easier using some of his outline material. So I have to give credit at the onset of that. I don't want anybody to think that I'm just some lazy preacher that grabs somebody else's material. But there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible is the material that we're concerned about today. Amen. Not the content of my outline. So anyway, let's get going here. So why study eschatology? Number one, it pertains to sound doctrine. Number two, it pertains to godly living. If you don't understand the last times, I'm not talking about every detail, but the doctrine of it, you won't have anything to live for. Um, 2 Peter 3 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Ready? What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. See, it gives us uh, this doctrine pertains to godly living. So it's very important, very practical. Third reason I want to study eschatology is because it gives us a, pop, a proper perspective on our lives. Amen. Let, let me uh, show you what I mean. In 2 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 4, beginning of verse 16, he says, For which cause we faint not? But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the next thing we look for is the return of Christ. Amen. The second coming, the resurrection of the dead. And it causes us to have some perspective on life. Like, you know, I may die before then and I'm going to meet God. Amen. I need to make sure I'm right with God in some areas. Or Christ may return while I'm alive and I'm going to meet God. And so I want to be right with God. You see the perspective it gives you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be a steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as... Uh, uh, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. So there's our perspective. I'll be honest with you. Most of the time when we talk about eschatology, even among Baptist brethren, speculation rules the day. Everything seems to be a guess. And 
It's like you throw it up and, and it all falls down and then you just choose a line and that's where you're going to be. And no one really investigates doctrinally what's being said. I have friends that make fun of me for my position, but they will not sit down and open the scriptures and show me why they believe what they believe. What are they so afraid of? The Bible. You can make fun all you want, but if you don't know what the scripture says and you can't defend it, you're going to have one that judgeth you. Amen. Anyway, we know that Christ is coming back. Everybody that calls themselves a Christian and most of the United States, America and Europe believes that Jesus Christ is coming back. However, when? Amen. That's always been the biggest deal. Lots of cults were started because they try to plot Jesus Christ's return. Amen. And it's always failed. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the nowadays guys don't know that because they're not allowed to read their former material. But they uh, projected the return of Christ to be 1918. I hate to say it, we're 102 years past that. I'm looking around, we're still here. Amen. Won't you I'm not talking about when and uh, as, as what year and so on. But the big debate seems to be among Baptists when, when, in, according, in accordance with the tribulation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, some people treat this subject as a mystery. In other words, you know, God will sort it all out. Just believe what you want to believe when it comes to eschatology. Now, they'll run off to Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Or Revelation 10, 4, uh, where John was about to write and the voice from heaven said, uh, seal up those things with the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Daniel, uh, it says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. People say, see, this is stuff we're just not supposed to know. Oh, wait a second, let me finish that verse on Daniel. He says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And nowhere can you find that that means uh, technology. Knowledge shall be increased. What kind of knowledge? The knowledge that's summed up. There's some mysteries here that's going to be made known. The great mystery is not when the Lord is returning. The great mystery that we talked about, was that Wednesday night? No, it was last Sunday. We talked about is the fact that Jew and Gentile alike through uh, regeneration and baptism make up the kingdom of heaven. Amen. That's the great mystery. So some people, they just, you know, well, it doesn't really matter. Or they'll get their information from books. Uh, TV, movies, boy, there's a lot of money makers, blockbusters over the subject of the rapture. A lot of Baptists, here's their problem, the fundamentalists, that in their Nicolaitanism, they follow everything the preacher says and they don't read it for themselves. If you're saved, you ought to be able to read the Word of God for yourself, amen, and understand it. Anyway, I want to give you kind of an overview of eschatological positions. Positions people hold concerning the last times. Amen? Uh, so y'all are going to college now. This is uh, eschatology 101, or I'll call it millennial 101, and we'll give you uh, one hour credit for it. Amen? First of all, let's talk about methods of interpretation. When it comes to interpreting the, uh, the doctrine of eschatology, the things that the scriptures say about eschatology, there's basically two views of how to interpret it. The first one is what we would call allegorical, or they spiritualize it. What that means, and by, by the way, the Seventh-day Adventists are wonderful with that. And what they do is um, <clears throat> they make things uh, where you can't really know. I mean, it leaves you wide open to interpret anything you want. Like the millennium, uh, these 
allegorical persons, they interpret the millennium as an uncertain time. It's just a uh, era. Wait a minute. God says a thousand years. A few times in the Bible makes it clear. Amen. By the way, you know who the first uh, documented proponents of that was? Origen, the self-castrating monk, and Augustine. Both purveyors of Catholic, what we know today to be Catholic doctrine. So, we, we don't take an allegorical approach. Uh, some people with the NIV, they came out, you know, when that came out in the 70s, I think the uh, refined version of the NIV came out in about 73. And uh, they said, well, that's not what Christ said when you look at the King James. And they say, yeah, but we believe in dynamic equivalency. In other words, it's not exactly what Christ said, it's what, what, what He generally means. Whoa, that's a problem. See, I'm not, I don't take an allegorical approach because I have verses like Matthew 4.4 4, where Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not every idea, every word, you see. So first of all, in my interpretation of things of the last days, where that's concerned, I take a literal view. 100% every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I do not change definitions. I let the Bible speak for itself. I let the Bible comment on itself. And that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to learn it. So number one... We already know uh, that if you want to know my position on eschatology, number one, it's a literal approach to the Word of God. Number two, the second thing I want to point out is there basically are three schools of thought concerning prophecy, specifically the book of Revelation. Okay? Number one, we talked about this a little bit um, either last week or Wednesday night. And that is what's called preterism. Preterism. Preterism teaches that all the events of the revelation were fulfilled. It's already done, all of it, and it was done in A.D. 70. Okay? Well, there has to be a whole lot of allegor alle allegoric interpretation to make that happen, doesn't there? Because... Um, I dismiss that view outright. I know there's some things that happened prior to 80, 70 and so on, but to take everything from the Revelation and say it's already happened at 80, 70, um, it, is, it, it, it does the Scriptures no justice. Because 2 Timothy 2.18 says, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some? That word is still important to us today. And if people are saying the resurrection is past already, they're overthrowing the faith of people and making them out to be preterists. Amen? That, two things that could happen to really help somebody. One, get saved. Two, read your Bible. Amen? You wouldn't believe in that. Acts 2.20 says this, Peter preaching, and he is quoting Joel the prophet from Joel chapter 2. And he says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So if this already happened in A.D. 70, there is absolutely no record of the sun being dark and the moon turning to blood ever in human history. The only way to fit that in would to be spiritualize darkness and blood. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> See, there's a place for allegory, but the Lord will tell us it's allegory. He may not use that word, but He'll use simile, metaphor, and so on. Amen? Parables. And we realize by the context, oh, He's, he's given an allegory here. And we can interpret it literally, though, with Scriptures. <clears throat> the second position, so when it comes to preterism, we reject that. Number two, historicism. Now, this teaches that Bible prophecy, and especially um, the book of Revelation, has already played out. Now, it didn't end at A.D. 70, but it played out 
through historic events. I, re I don't reject all of that because there are some things historically true in Revelation that we are living right now. Amen? Uh, however, for the same reason of the last one, uh, it's obvious the resurrection has not taken place. And sometimes these historicists, they still look for a resurrection. But anyway, let me give you the third one. A futurist. A futurist. A futurist teaches that all the events of the book of Revelation are entirely future. None of them have happened yet. Okay? Well, I'll take a combination of the last two, historic and futurist. But you know what? I'm not going to put those with my name, just like I will not line in, align myself in a camp of Calvinism or, um, what, what's the other one called? Uh, yes. I'm not going to do that. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Biblicist. I want to know what the Bible says. So I'm not a historicist and I'm not a futurist. I'm a Biblicist. So what do we know so far about our views on eschatology? Number one, it's literal and it's what the Bible says. Nothing else. Amen. I believe the Bible combines all of it. Some things have happened. Some things are yet to happen. All right. Now this leads us to another thing I want to point out. There's three views of the millennium. Now the word millennium is not in the Bible. It simply means thousand. And we say millennium for the thousand year reign of Christ. Amen. When that's going to take place. And there's three positions on that thousand year reign. And again, <laughs> most are wrong. The first one is amillennialism. Now that teaches that there's no literal reign of Christ. So what kind of people are these? They allege. They spiritualize. They don't take it literal. If you take it literal, there is absolutely no way that you can be an amillennialist. Okay? Now, these folks teach that Christ reigns now spiritually through the, quote, church. When these people say church, they mean the Catholics and the Protestants. Okay? But the world will become gradually darker until Christ comes uh, and there will be a general resurrection uh, and a general judgment. So a lot of specifics of Revelation just gets thrown right out the door. Obviously, we're not amillennialists. Amen? The second one I'll point out is what's called a post-millennialist. Post meaning after. So after the thousand year reign. And it teaches that there is no literal thousand year reign of Christ. So what kind of people are these? They're spiritualizing the scriptures instead of um, literally interpreting them. And it says that there, there's no thousand year reign of Christ and the world gets uh, worse while the church stays bright and then when Christ comes in, it ushers in a new world. That is the same doctrine of Antichrist. I, I've been alive long enough that I remember the fifth dimension singing their greatest hit. And I was in Germany with my parents. I was a child. And it was Aquarius. This is, and, and at that time, it was called the Age of Pisces, a fish. You ever notice all these, quote, Christians, they put a little fish on it. Anyway, but, but their song was, this is the dawning of the Age of Aquarius. Aquarius means many, 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 many fish. And what, we, what are we looking for when it comes to the Antichrist uh, in Scripture? One rises up out of the sea, one of many. So what they're seeing is, the, is ushering in the day of the false prophet and the beast of Revelation. A post-millennialist does the exact same thing. He says it's just going to be bad. And then, uh, uh, you know, when, when things get better, uh, well, you know, uh, we're going to start Christianizing the world. And, and as we Christianize the world, the world's going to get better and better and brighter and brighter, and then Jesus can come back. That's why you see me changing some of the words uh, in our songbook. Because it makes it sound like this post-millennialism. 
Yeah, that's the church. See, the church to them. Who's the church to these post-millennialists? Catholics and Protestants. Amen? Oh, yeah, it's a world's a dark place, but oh, Christ's kingdom on earth here, the church, all the saved, are, you know, universal church. They're, they're going to make the place better and better. That's why we got to win the lost at any cost. With our soul winning antics, we run into that doctrine as well. So, yes, there's a millennium. The Bible says there is one, so we're not all millennialists. Yes, there's a millennium, but it's going to be because Christ has to come in and straighten things out. It's not going to be because we as a church straighten it out. Amen? So that leads us to our position. I would in, uh, call myself a pre-millennialist. So what we have so far is I am a literal, biblical, Christ returns before the thousand year reign. That's my doctrine right there so far. Premillennialism teaches us that the world gets darker and more wicked until everything culminates in a tribulation. And then that great tribulation is that that tribulation is under a man known as the man of sin or the Antichrist. And then Christ returns visibly and bodily to the earth, defeats the Antichrist and his armies, and rules from Jerusalem over the earth for a thousand years. That's my position. Now let's break that down a little bit. There's two views of pre-millennialism. See why we got to learn doctrine? Because when you hear some of these words, you go, what, what's it talking about? There's two views of pre-millennialism. One, there is historic pre-millennialism. I hate it when people have to put titles on things. Just believe the Bible. But... Historic premillennialism teaches that Christ will gather his saints at the end of the tribulation when he returns at his second coming just prior to setting up his thousand year reign. That's the historic position. Go back, take your computer program, whatever, go back to every commentary you can from a Baptist as early as possible, and every one of them believes that Christ returns to start His millennial reign, and He gathers His people at the end of the tribulation to do it. That is the earliest teaching, and so on. I'm going to give you more on that in a minute. You probably won't believe me. Good, look it up. So, there's the historic premillennialism. Now, here comes the greatest enemy, I believe, of Baptist churches today. And I believe it is, is helping with things like this um, easy believism and so on. And that is dispensational premillennialism. It teaches that Christ... Now, I, I've talked about dispensations. God worked in a different way at different times in the Bible and so on. And what it leads to, uh, objectively and honestly, it leads to several types of salvation through the Bible. That's right. But people will stop there. Oh, I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. Well, then you're not reading the verses on your own doctrine. Because if you are, you'd be like Peter Ruckman and believe of multiple ways of being saved in the book of Acts alone. Amen? He's probably the greatest example of a, of a dispensational a premillennialist that I've ever met. Anyway, what they teach is that Christ will rapture His saints prior to a seven-year uh, tribulation period, which allegedly, remember allegory, <laughs> which allegedly is called the 70th week of Daniel. This teaching is designed that the average Christian does not know what the 70th week of Daniel is. And if he knew it, he wouldn't believe this bunch of trash. Anyway, they believe that the tribulation is strictly for the Jews and is described as the time of Jacob's trouble. You can find the context of that in Jeremiah and it is the time of the Babylonian captivity. In context. Well, we're going to spiritualize it. There you go, you dishonest IFBers. You just did it, didn't you? So anyway, now... There's, there's variations. I'm giving you a generalization and I don't think anyone I know fits everything about this, okay? But they believe that Christ will return 
first he raptures them before the tribulation, so that's his second coming. And then he comes back at the end of the tribulation, that's his third coming. I'm really looking for that in the Bible, or is it a second, second coming? Or was there a first, second coming? Or is it the second, first coming? I'm confused. But anyway, now listen to this. They usually believe in general that there will be a resurrection at the beginning of the tribulation uh, called the rapture where the saints, the New Testament saints, are resurrected and those alive, they go to be with Jesus. And they, quote, go to the judgment seat of Christ, people trying to fit it all in. And while the seven-year tribulation is going on, and then at the end of the tribulation, now listen to this, there will be a resurrection again of Old Testament saints along with the martyred tribulation saints. Works. Works, works, works. That's what dispensationalists lead you into. Then Christ will set up His literal thousand-year kingdom on earth. I've got a problem. I happen to be reading my Bible, which is a huge mistake if you're a dispensationalist and you want to remain so. And you find that this thing of the resurrection of the Old Testament dead, when you go to Matthew 27 and you find that the saints arose and were around Jerusalem for uh, three days with Christ. Hmm, if that wasn't Old Testament saints, then who is that? Right. Just think about it. Anyway, so what do we got going here so far? If you want to know Brother Sam's doctrine, it is a literal, biblical, uh, premillennial, historic premillennial position. It's a lot of words. You're going to have a test after this. All right, so now we finally, now that we understand these basics, let's now get into rapture timing just a little bit because the whole series is going to be on rapture timing. So I'm not going to sit and just dig it today. I'm going to give you a little bit to think about. Amen. Number one, when it comes to rapture timing, there is a pre-tribulation, pre-trib doctrine or belief. Um the dispensational premillennialists, they teach this pre-trib doctrine. It teaches that Christ will rapture, quote, the church. Anytime you ever hear the phrase rapture the church, you know they're universal, you know they're false doctrine, and they're probably lost because they don't have enough desire after 30 years of being a Christian to find out more truth. I mean, right? You know them by their fruits, not by what they say. But they believe this rapture of, quote, the church, the universal specter of Christ, made up of all the saved, is prior to the seven-year tribulation. Let me tell you when this view came into being. Look it up for yourself. It came in the middle of the 19th century. By the way, that is the exact same time that Darwinism came along. That is also the exact same time that it was okay to start questioning the King James Bible. And by 1880, we had the revised version. Huh? This is not something I would want to point to as a time of benefit for the Christian, would you? No, not at all. But in 1830, a vision came to a young girl about 20 years old named Margaret MacDonald. That's M-A-C, Donald. Look it up. A charismatic who had visions. Well, it created a ruckus, and because they started speaking in tongues and all this other stuff, manifestations. Well, it was made popular... <laughs> Only this, this is like a TV show. It was made popular by John Nelson Darby. Now, there's a lot of people in between, but John Nelson Darby first heard about this junk going on in Mary McDonald's church. And by the way, John Nelson Darby is a Plymouth brethren. He's not a Baptist, he's a Protestant. He takes a Protestant view of the church, he takes a Protestant view of the scriptures, and he's an allegory most of the time. So already consider the source, right? 
But when Darby went to visit this and, and research this, what was going on, okay, and it wasn't like real quick time, it took a few years, he laughed at it and said it was demonic. That's a matter of record. But yet he said there might be something to that vision of the pre-trib rapture though. And so John Nelson Darby made that famous, and probably in our lifetime, uh, well, not in our lifetime, but the most influential on our lifetime is a fellow by the name of C.I. Schofield, which took Darby's teachings and put them into his, um, his notes. That's almost unbelievable, isn't it? All right, then there's the mid-trib position, which teaches that Christ will rapture His saints at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. In other words, the first three and a half years goes on, the saints are there, and then the last three and a half, being as that's considered the wrath of God poured out, He will, because we're not appointed under wrath, He will come and rapture us out. It doesn't sound much like days of Noah to me. Days of Noah, they were right in the midst of all the judgment and wrath of God, but they were protected during it. So that is a bad, bad comparison to have to force a rapture at the mid. We'll talk about these more as we go. But then finally, we've arrived at Brother Sam's position. I am a literal, biblical, historic, premillennial, post-tribulational Baptist. That means I believe Christ is coming one time, the second time, as the Bible says, and it comes after the tribulation. It teaches that He will gather His saints at His second coming, and it coincides, when you read the book of Revelation, with the first resurrection. This post-trib position, look it up, is also called the historic premillennial position. Because it's the oldest view. I'll go with the old stuff. Amen? So let me close by saying this. As you've probably already detected, there's a lot of doctrinal issues involved with this subject. It's not just eschatology. Kingdom gets distorted. Church becomes university, uh, universal. Israel of God, on, according to Galatians, is just utter confusion. Um... And then, I want to look at something. I'm going to read a few of these and this will be our close. I actually want to look at some literal statements about Christ's return. Because I asked the pre-trib guys, I say, can you show me a verse that gives, that, that discusses timing? And if they do, they learn quickly that that timing is always at the end. So, I'm a literal, historic, premillennial, post-tribulational Baptist. In Matthew 24, 29, Jesus says, now, boy, the, I'm telling you, the Bible just blows your theology if it's not right. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, is that clear? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened. Isn't that what we said earlier, the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Boy, there's a wonderful description of that in the book of Revelation. It's called the tribulation. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds one from from one end of heaven to the other did that not just describe that that is the rapture that these people talk about and it takes place when let me say it again immediately after the tribulation of those days let me go a little further let's let's talk about another rapture verse that is specific on timing or, or at least manner of coming. In Acts chapter 1, beginning of verse 9, Jesus, when He had spoken these things, why they beheld, He was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. What received Him? Cloud. Okay. Matthew said He comes with clouds. Okay, that's interesting. 
So he takes them out of his, their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as, as he went up, they're watching, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as, have, as ye have seen Him go into heaven. So according to the doctrine of being a literal, historic, biblicist, my searching for Christ's return, would it not be with clouds and coming down bodily uh, to the earth as He went up? Would that not be it? Yes, that is it, literally. But the pre-trib people, they throw in, well, he's going to come and he's going to be hidden in clouds and he's going to rapture all the people of the church, which, boy, you see lots of doctrine and trouble there. And then after seven, he's going to keep them safe for seven years, then he's going to come back with them. And that's three comings, not two. Or it's two and a half at best. It's nowhere described. One of the first verses, verses that they will run to is 1 Thessalonians 4. But let me tell you something. 1 Thessalonians 4 does not discuss timing. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. By the way, where did the apostles see him go into? Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? What's, what's that heaven? What were they looking at? Sky. The Lord shall descend from heaven. Same sky. With a shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall, be ri shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see, when you put together timing and manner, boy, there's no doubt. I'll give you one more. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. When you read Revelation as a premillennialist, good luck with that, you're going to use commentary. I'm sorry, if you read it, you'd switch your position. When does, when does the rapture occur or the, the glorious rising of the saints? At the last trump. How many last trumps are there? There's only one. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So, the basics is that we are literal, historical, premillennialists. In other words, we mean Christ is going to come before the, the uh, uh, thousand year reign. And our millennialism is broken down. We are not dispensationalists, we are historic. In other words, we believe the next thing, according to the Bible, is that Christ returns. And then we looked at the rapture timing, and we are post-tribulational. Now, if you don't understand all that, that's okay. We, we're definitely going to revisit these ideas again as we go through this series. So anyway, hope that was a blessing to you, and I pray the Lord would bless you for listening.